your seatbelt. It's going to be a bug you walk. Chrissy is hilarious. Chrissy, have you ever heard of the comedian Basha K. Ali? No, that sounds like something you yell at before you blow up a plane. <laughs> 30 seconds remaining. Like, what would you say? I doubt it. I was very confused by the title, Everything Everywhere All at Once, because that's also what we call it when the ass takes off his shirt. (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't be up here. I should be in school on the other side of the ocean. What's up, boys and girls? Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Rumble, Rockfin, all the places where podcasts are sold or you can listen to for free. Uh, I got to do a quick shout out to some of my dates coming up before I bring in my fabulous guest who I'm so thrilled is on today. Like I'm actually being a fanboy. Uh, right now, but I'm going to be in Rochester at the beginning of next month, February do 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 third and fourth. I'll be at DabbleCon in Rochester. Um, get your tickets now. The, all these events are going to happen at Comedy at the Carlson, 50 Carlson Road in Rochester. We're doing a stand-up show, live podcast taping. See me, Anthony Cumia, Bob Levy, um, Shuli Egar, everybody from the Stuttering John Dabbleverse will be there. Then I'll be heading to California at the end of February. The 23rd, I'll be in Pasadena performing at an Elks Lodge. And then I'll be in San Diego at the Mic Drop Comedy Club the 24th and 25th. Check it out. Then I'll be heading to Staten Island. Ooh, beautiful Staten Island in April. April 7th at Paradise Island. Then I'll be in Jersey headlining Morris Plains at Tiff's Ale House Saturday, April 8th. Then I'm heading to Houston in Texas in August for Anime Matsuri. Then I'll be headlining the secret group in Houston. Um, not really part of the of the convention, but if you're a fan and you're there, please come. We'll hang. It'll be like a big old after party. Awesome. So excited to have this guy today. Uh, I feel honored that he's uh, giving me his time today. I'm sure you've probably seen his, his viral speech uh, from the Oxford Union uh, where he sort of was able to I think re- he has a really uh, a knack for reaching the youth, <laughs> reaching the youth. There's no way I can say this without sounding like an old person myself, but uh, I'm so happy to have him here. Uh, satirist, YouTuber, comedian, all things, Constantine Kissin. Welcome. Hey, Chrissy. How are you? I am super. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm such a big fan. I'm going to scroll your thing at the bottom so people can follow you. Um I'm sure many people have had you on to talk about your viral speech at the Oxford Union Um, really, really quickly, because that's probably how most people recognize you who are who are watching right now. You know, you didn't seem to be reading off of a script or need a teleprompter. How did you prepare for that? Did you just speak from the heart? And I mean, I know as a stand up, you're probably you're great at, you know, just kind of improvising and memorizing made up crap yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> no well i i tend to when when i'm speaking i tend to have like a i think for ages and ruminate on what i'm about to say for the few days leading up to it uh and then what actually happened was i was supposed to be first i was supposed to be opening the main reason uh, and what happened was uh, they had to change around the order so i ended up being the last speaker instead so basically all my oh, arguments got yeah. made for me so i had to adjust a little bit in, in on the fly uh but yeah i had i had to think about it and i always think it's you you make you're going to be much more impactful if you're not reading because it distracts people and it takes their attention away from what you're saying so i always re- try to do that when i possibly can wow yeah, you did mention like, well, a lot of people have <laughs> made my points already, which is kind of yeah. like my biggest fear in stand up that I'll I'll listen to like an opener or, an, or a host and they're going to make a point that I want to make or tell a joke that's similar to mine. But I mean, this this blew people away. Um, basically, I'm going to play a tiny snippet of it in case you guys haven't heard it. But this whole speech is about nine minutes. 
anything else. And I thank the other speakers for making the points for me because you know why? Because they're poor. Yeah, you're the just the speech was like I, I'm just I'm so blown away with what you did here because as an elder millennial, like I, I very much remember being in college age. And I, I think the whole point of civilization is like merging the older generations with the younger generations. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember wanting to be anti-authority, anti whatever my parents were doing. I wanted to get a tattoo, a cartilage piercing. Now it's like if you want to rebel against your parents, you flip your dick inside out and you get new genitals. Like things have changed, right? Pretty, <laughs> so, pretty radical, isn't that? But you still have to be 18 to get a tattoo. What is happening? You did such a good job in this speech of, of really speaking to Gen Z, being like, hey, I know you guys are capable of more than just complaining, than just mm -hmm. about defacing protesting throwing soup on a painting like i know you guys are smart and i know you're capable of more than this and it's not it's basically you're saying like it's not your fault we're so quick to shit on other generations and i think people are quick to shit on gen z as like just making tiktoks in their car and like not really doing anything of worth which is similar to what people have said about millennials but we didn't have tiktok when we were sort of coming of age and you did such a good job of saying like, hey, this is not your fault. It's this is kind of being thrust upon you. Uh, you have as individuals potential to work, create, build. You focused on like you, the only way to, to see our way through climate change, if that is something you think exists. <laughs> I'm not going to say it doesn't exist, but like, is it the is it the crazy? Emergency? I get the sense that you're slightly less than convinced is by your I, reaction. I think I know the climate is changing. I just I just think it's being manipulated for certain people to make money off of and certain people to be kept down. I'm not I don't think the planet is not the climate is not changing. I just I think I'm being very cynical about it. And uh, and I also think human beings have less impact than than we think on the on the planet's weather i think if you go back th we had several ice ages we had hot times we had cold whatever that's not the point the point is is that <laughs> you you're saying you're focusing on saying to these kids i assume everybody here is like college age that's listening to you you're 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 saying it without saying it you're not saying fuck the woke da 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 cuz i'm sure they're tired of hearing that you're kind of saying it without saying it. You're like, we need to focus on work, create, and build. And as soon as I heard you say those three words, I was like, there it is. That's that is the opposite of wokeism because human beings are either we're either creating or destroying. And I think wokeism focuses solely on destroying, but they're not thinking about. They're kind of passively, oh, you know, they're not thinking about what they're creating in its place. And then the powers that be can come in and create what they want and i think gen z is being used as like a chaos generation mm. to destroy and make room for so i just i love the way that you did this and i caught a clip of you saying after this you know this speech went viral not a single left-wing show or uh, newspaper any anywhere none of them hit you up to talk to you about this how did how do you feel about that well, it's it's weird, isn't it? Because I'm not on the right or on the left. I always joke that I identify as politically non-binary, and and that's how I like to to be. Um, so it, it's it's quite weird that I, I end up in a position where uh, it goes as viral as it did. It's probably done a, somewhere between 100 and 200 million views now across different platforms, um, and yet no left-wing publication or show wants to interview me about it or even broadcast. I don't, I'm not saying I deserve attention or whatever. I just I find it quite <laughs> odd that they wouldn't cover it. And I think it's because, you know, if you think about what wokeness is, it's this ideology of perpetual victimhood. Uh, someone coming along and saying work, build, create, or work, create, build, it, it doesn't match what they're, what they're selling and it, it doesn't match what the agenda is. So it's disappointing. It's disappointing because I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I don't know where your politics are, but I don't think anyone could have watched that speech and gone, that's a right wing speech or that's a left wing speech. I just thought it was, uh, I really tried not to go into that tribal bullshit that I, I don't really have time for. I wanted to talk to young people about what they can do uh, rather than, as you say, I mean, look, I don't think saying fuck the work is, I mean, it's not going to convince young people. Um, they don't uh, so, like to hear that they're wrong. That doesn't go no, over well, really, for no, anybody. 
No, nobody does. So I tried to make an argument that appealed to both the logic, but also of the, to their desire. You know, we were all young once, sadly, and uh, we wanted to, you know, improve the world and change the world. And we thought anything's possible and whatever. Um, and I, I think that's you have to. The only thing you can do with that energy in young people is to harness it and go. Okay, you want to change the world. Well, if you want to change the world, you're going to have to work hard, and then you're going to have to learn things. And then when you learn things, you're going to have to work out to build stuff. And when you build stuff, guess what? Uh, you know, a friend of mine, Melissa Chen, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Uh, she she did she had a great tweet. She said, uh, it's impossible to remain woke if you when building anything, whether that's muscle, a business, a career, like anything. And that's because when you are building stuff, you're confronted with how difficult things are. And then you kind of go, well, maybe, you know, other people who are not doing the things that I want them to do. Is it possible that they're just like me doing their best with a, you know, and you kind of start to realize that, uh, you know, to build anything, you have to actually let go of victimhood and you have to have a proactive approach. And that's where I think we, we got to focus on. I think a lot of us have spent a long time and I include myself for this, you know, trigonometry, the YouTube show that we do. We've talked a lot about wokeness and been critical about it. And, and rightly so. It, there's a lot to criticize. But ultimately, I think people like us are going to have to start thinking about, well, what's the positive vision? Like, what are we selling people exactly? Like, OK, woke, wokeness is stupid. All right, cool. Now what? What are you supposed to do with your life? Right. And I think our generation, I am just about a millennial, just about. Uh, and uh, the, the, obviously the next generation, they don't, I mean, the biggest problem of our time is a lack of purpose and a lack of meaning. Like people, that's why Jordan Peterson blew up the way that he did, because everyone in our generation is like, do they, do, no one knows what they're supposed to do, right? Is it or endless dates on dating apps? Is that is that life? Is that meaning of your life? Like, So I think all of us are going to have to start to think a little bit harder about, well, what are we, what are we offering people exactly? Like, why should you join our non-tribe tribe is, is how I think about it, right? Um, and I think we're going to have to start to think about what those positives look like. And that's a lot harder because it's much easier to be like the woke and go, oh, this is bad. This is shit. This is terrible, right? What's What, what are we offering? What's the positive vision? Right. And and wokeness can very easily, God, distract you for, for decades, like... And then you turn around, you're like, oh, I haven't accomplished anything. Like, I've just mm -hmm. been a shit stirrer. Um, you were on Tucker Carlson recently. Congrats. That's awesome. Uh, Famously said, centrist guy. Famous. <laughs> and you said something that really resonated with me. You said adults right now are afraid of young people. And this, mm -hmm. this touches on so much that's going on. I mean, this touched on why Jordan Peterson blew up because a lot of college age kids are used to like, and it, we see all these viral TikToks and clips of teachers and kids. It's like, and when we were all in school, we were of course always looking for ways to have power over the teachers. Substitute comes in. We know, all right, this is great. Mm. The kids are going to run the show today. Like we're going to play. Yeah. yeah we're going to just start humming until she goes, what are you guys humming? And then they, she turns around and we stop and go, Hmm. And now it's like, well, now the kids are, uh, punching teachers in the head everything's escalated but kids are always gonna push against boundaries and and test the adults around them and why jordan peterson blew up it's because he was just like no i'm not going to i'm not gonna call you by the pronouns you want because that means and i'm i'm really like whittling this down but he's like basically that means that's giving you the power and i'm supposed to be teaching and like what the fuck so mm -hmm. and, and i think wokeism generally is a way for is a way to make people kind of afraid to challenge you or have a conversation or bring up facts it's, it's like oh and it's it's very creative and clever the way the way it's been done um but it's it, also it a very like conspiratorial worldview if you think about it like there are obviously a lot of conspiracies on the right as well but if you and they're both they're all conspiracies generally are designed to disempower the people who believe them like it's it's the jews or it's it's the it's the patriarchy right okay well in that case i don't have to do anything right because because the jews have taken control or the, the the straight white toxic men or whoever whoever you want it to be uh and it's very disempowering and it gives people excuses for why they are not what they want to be that's why that's a lot of the appeal of wokeness is is like you don't have to do anything 
you don't have to do it. Just so take your phone out and cancel some comedian on Twitter, and, and now you've changed the world for the better. Like, that's a narrative that appeals to people who are lazy and who don't want to work for what they want. Yeah, just post your black square, just post your rainbow flag. Now post this updated rainbow flag, and you're good. You've done your work. Yeah. Uh, you you were a stand-up comic, uh, and you told me before we went live that you actually have not done any stand-up since before the pandemic, which everyone, you know, ha has a journey. They'll do stand-up. Sometimes they'll do a podcast. Sometimes, you know, everyone's got a different sort of path. But how did you go from being a comedian to starting trigonometry to being very outspoken on, you know, being this outspoken political commentator and, you know, writing for Quillette and The Spectator and The Daily Telegraph. And now you're like this viral sensation. And now you're kind of like, eh, I don't know. Stand up's not really doing it for me anymore. So how did you get to this point? Well, I, uh, so we, Francis and I, who's my co host, we started trigonometry in April 2018. So a couple of years before the pandemic. Uh, and we started it for two reasons, really. Number one, we felt that it, you probably, you're lucky in America that you don't quite have this, but the UK circuit is very small and the structure of it, because there's only really one comedy circuit, like people who live on the, the most Southern point of the UK will gig on the most Northern point of the UK. That's kind of part of it. Like if you live in, L in London, you'd also perform in Scotland. Everybody plays the same circuit. And that means that if you do comedy that someone somewhere doesn't like, or you have opinions that someone somewhere doesn't like, that's it. Like, it's not like America where, you know, you don't like the New York circuit. Well, go and go to LA. You don't like the LA circuit. Go, you know, the, there's, there's options there. And of course we also don't have, uh, you know, we don't have a first amendment, but much more importantly, we don't have a first amendment culture. Uh, mm -hmm. right. You guys have that attitude of freedom of speech is very important. We don't. And so, in about 2018, we have what the Edinburgh Festival, which is the biggest art and comedy festival in the world. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we yeah. do get, yeah. And so the Edinburgh Festival is essentially controlled by like five people who decide who is good. God, this who, sounds like the New York scene. <laughs> right, 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 right. And who is bad. And in 2018, the woman who was in charge of it, she gave a speech at the, the annual awards in which she said that she looks forward to the new era of woke comedy, uh, where comedians, woke comedians are once again deciding what isn't, isn't acceptable to say. Ugh. And we were like, uh oh, this doesn't sound good. And also, this came in the wake of uh, Brexit and, and Trump. And neither Francis or I were big fans. We voted Remain, which I suppose would be the equivalent of, you know, voting for Hillary Clinton in 2016 on our end. Um, but also, like, the, immediately the narrative became, well, everyone who voted to leave the European Union is a massive racist. And I was like, look, I'm a first-generation immigrant with a foreign name and dark skin. I've lived in this country since 1995. Like, this is not a racist country. What are you talking about? And so it was also like we were trying to understand what was happening to the comedy industry and the world more broadly. And so we were like, let's start a, a show where two comics, we interview people who actually know what they're talking about and try and get a sense of what's going on. So so that's how it started. Uh, and then by the time the pandemic hit, I mean, when the pandemic hit, obviously we couldn't carry on doing stand-up. And it coincided with trigonometry taking off like big time. So we went from, I think, probably about 90,000 YouTube subscribers to like well over 200,000 in wow. the space of a year. I really shot off and we went from comedians who did trigonometry part time to guys who, uh, you know, uh, I didn't live together with, with Francis and our executive producer, but they lived together. We like rented an apartment where I slept on the, on the, on the couch three days a week. Uh, and we just started making it full time. Uh, yeah. And then, also, what happened during the pandemic, we were obviously locked down for a while. We couldn't do anything, couldn't travel. And my wife was like, oh, it's, it's kind of nice to see you again. Because <laughs> I was driving myself, you know, pretty hard. I was trying to get trigonometry to, to, to shoot off. And uh, my stand-up career was just about starting to do really well. And I was doing other stuff. And so my, you know, it, my, my life was pretty, pretty unsustainable is the truth. So... We wanted to have kids and we've just had a, we have a, a, our son, he's eight month old. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, right. and so all of that being the case, we were like, you know what? I, I don't think this makes sense for me to carry on. And I think also the truth is, Chrissy, is I think there are some comics who need stand up and there are some comics who like doing stand up. I was not the former. I was definitely the latter. Like I, we do a three week, three days a week. Uh, we, we do a show on our channel called raw and that's where me and Francis would just do the most offensive shit about the news of the day, do every <laughs> foreign accent. We mm -hmm. weird hats on and joke around and whatever that fulfills me creatively. I don't need what a lot of comics need is standing on stage and seeing 300 people look at you like your God. Like that's what it, that's what's in it for a lot of comedians. I think I really, I, I was never one of them. Um, so all those things came together and now I'm just like, I'm really enjoying my life. You, and that's what I learned too, in doing my podcast, like you can really uh, express yourself. You can like hit that, whatever funny bone, you can feel like, all right, I'm being creative and it's, it's different. Like you're not getting an, an immediate roar of laughter from a crowd, but you're like, oh, look at these comments. Look at this. Mm. It's like you are seeing, you are getting feedback, just like any kind of a post, or if you post a TikTok of your stand up or whatever. Um, but I started to feel like, like similarly, the pandemic just like woke me up and was like, oh wow, like I think I'm meant to do more with my life than just mm. do stand up. I think I'm meant, I think being funny is the vehicle that's going to drive uh, the message of, of how I can help, I guess, society. It's not, it's totally. It, and and what most comics don't learn, it's not enough just to be funny anymore. It's always about the what else. It's like you're funny yeah. and what else? You're funny and you like motorcycles. You're funny, you're into tattoos. You're funny and you're libertarian. Okay, so like the what else is going to provide your fan base, the people who buy tickets to see you or listen to your stuff or click on you or read your sub stack. So, mm. and it's good that you were in touch with that because a lot of uh we see a lot of comics who make it and that's very glamorous. And then we hear from, I, I feel like I hear, from a lot of comics who are just sort of floundering and there's almost like a glamour in the poverty of, of kind of like the stand-up comedy open mic yeah, scene. Yeah, but, but here's the thing, Chrissy. I always knew there's, I, I have been poor. And so I know there ain't, there is no fucking glamour in comedy uh, and being poor at all. There is no there's glamour not, in being poor. There's no glamour in struggling. There's no glamour in being unsuccessful. I, I never wanted any of that. Uh, and there are a lot of comics, I think that's how they cope with the lack of success. They go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a struggling artist. Well, fuck that. I don't want to be a struggling anything. Yeah. Do you want to share a bathroom with five other grown men? <laughs> if you search deep inside, the answer is no. Because <laughs> someone's always going to be in there when you need it. You wrote, um, God, I love this so much. Um, this was in your, this is in your sub stack. This is a mm. letter to your newborn son. It's called We Do Not Kneel. Uh, I like almost started crying reading this and I guess I want to know like what, in, what inspired writing this because basically the gist of this is like uh, something that, and I think about this a lot, you know, when they're like, oh, when, when Kim Kardashian and Kanye were like fighting and breaking up and, and Kim's all like, oh, I want to shield my kids from who he is as a person. And, and this is something you, you think about when you have kids and you're a, a very online or very public person mm. is, is like, how are they going to interpret how you've lived your life and you want them to get you right. You want them to understand you. And this, in this piece, you're, you're writing to him. You're like, yeah, you're, you're going to hear that. Uh, I was passionate or people will, will call me, you know, uh, overly aggressive. I guess you can probably explain it better, but yeah. What kind of inspired this letter? What inspired it? I talk about it in, in, in this letter where, uh, when he was born, a bunch of people sent in, uh, you know, congratulations and whatever. And one of them said, I, I really look forward to seeing the softer side of you. Hmm. And it, it made me think that people think, you know, I don't consider myself to be like a harsh person. I don't think I am. Uh, but what, what I often get is, you know, if I express an opinion or a, a, something that I think is the truth, frankly, quite directly, people respond to that as if it's kind of inappropriate. And this is less the case over in the States because you guys can be pretty direct, especially in New York, I found. But uh, in the UK, everything is supposed to be coaxed in, you know, well, I'm not sure, but, and I would just, you know, uh, it's all like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think people often confuse, you know, someone who, who expresses things directly and is comfortable in saying, this is what I think, with being arrogant or being harsh or whatever. So I wanted to write about that. But also, you know, it's funny you say that, wanting to be understood by kids, because that's really not how I think about it. And uh, I think 
I don't think actually it's the job of a parent to, to a large extent for me. I'm like, son, here's some information I want to communicate to you, you know, many years from now when you are able to read it. Um, and then, you know, you draw your own conclusions. I, I'm not trying to be mm. uh, anything for my son. I'm, I'm just trying to be the best version of me. And then I said, I hope that he can see that, you know, I, that, that's kind of my attitude. And, you know, coming back, Chrissy, to what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, adults being afraid of young people. I think that's kind of partly it. Like we've lost the ability to say, you know, we are the adults and you don't have to like us, but we are the authority by virtue of being adults. And here's how this is going to go. And here's some information you might need and you take it or leave it. It's up to you. Everyone's got to go through their own journey, but we as adults have to tell you this stuff and inspire you to, to, to be better. Yeah, and you right here, you see, son, the world is full of people who mistake passion for extremism, confidence for arrogance, and drive for selfishness and ambition. No matter who you are and what you do, you will encounter this over and over again. And I'm sure you saw this the more outspoken you became. I'm sure you have hit pieces written about you, just like I do. I'm sure people Google you. There's all sorts of insults for you, people calling you an ist, a phobe, um, all of the things. So I think that's an important distinction to make like that, the basically, and, and you talk about in this human beings, we, we want to blend in. We want, we don't want to stand out. It's like a deep survival thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I learned something in reading this, like the people that are, that you trigger it's because we're all of us are a mirror for each other. And it like, mm. cause I noticed the people that I trigger online and I'm like, this is crazy. It seems to be the, the people who hate me really hate me. And you say in this, like, if you're confident, you're going to, you're going to trigger people who are not confident. If you go for your dreams, you're going to trigger people who played it safe and never went for their dreams. Well, uh, I found that was with, with stand up actually, because, uh, we talked a little bit about this before we started. So in 20, the very end of 2018, I got offered this, um, safe space contract to do a show at a college. And it said, uh, get this, it said that they have a zero. So I have to sign this contract to perform there. By the way, they invited me because they liked my set and they wanted me to help them raise money for charity. So I'm donating my time to these entitled little pricks and they're trying to get me to sign a contract, right? Uh, and, and the contract said that they had a zero tolerance policy on racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, <laughs> biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion, anti-atheism and it also said that all jokes must be respectful and kind anti-atheism right? you can't even make fun of atheists yeah. that's how well, i know this is a cult yeah like, they're an oppressed minority chrissy uh, uh, and and so and and when i turned it down you won't believe how naive i was i thought i was taking one for team comedy mm -hmm. i thought here i am standing up for my fellow comics being able to make jokes about whatever subjects they want right and you know what happened? Most of the comedy industry in this country openly attacked me. Wow. Yeah. And, and I think it'd be tempting for me to say that it was ideological and part of it definitely was, you know, there's a big sort of like, we must be kind movement within the British comedy, but a lot of it was just jealousy. They were just jealous mm -hmm. that he was on the, in every newspaper and so on and so forth. So the more, I have found that the more success we have with trigonometry and the more profile I acquire, the more two things happen. On the one hand, the bitter little haters get more bitter and more hateful. But also, actually, over time, I found that a lot of the people who used to criticize me are now coming over to my side and going, you know what? Actually, I see the point you were making. Or, you know, and, and the success almost proves to them that it wasn't me that was crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah, you were just, uh, you're just maybe ahead of my time it. slightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Students are being taught to prevent offense rather than seek truth and pursue experiences. It's like, is the person that wrote this letter for you to sign, like, are they familiar with what comedy is? It's, it's literally supposed to push buttons, offend people, <laughs> and trigger folks. Like, that's why are you getting out and uh, going to a place to hear somebody speak? If it's like, then go hear somebody, you know, do a TED talk. Don't listen to stand up comedy. Well, that's what a lot of comedy has become in the UK. So you're right on the money. Yeah. What's her face? Um, God, what was her name? She had, she did a special. Then she said I was done. And then she did another special. Hannah Gatsby. Lesbian. Yes. The lesbian. Hannah Gatsby. The lesbian. 
<laughs> the contract this contract says it does not mean that these topics cannot be discussed, but it must be done in a respectful and non-abusive way. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many respectful, non-abusive jokes I have that are actually funny. Exactly. Maybe some people can do it. Damn. Okay, so you never actually, that's wild. And it reminds me of, you know, I haven't performed comedy outside of the States, but it does make me grateful. Like you mentioned, it's not only freedom of speech, but the culture of freedom of speech. Yeah. Because Mike Ward uh, was a guy out of Canada. He actually had a show on Compound Media where, where I have a show too. He ended up getting sued over a joke. Like he made fun of... Uh, a singer, I think, that was disabled or something, and and that guy ended up suing him, and it was just a huge legal battle battle for years. I think he ultimately won his case, but not after spending a fortune on lawyers. Um, in this country, we have the police frequently uh, investigating comedians for jokes. Uh, it's happened several times now. What does that look like? Uh, what it looks like is you. someone gets upset about a joke. It becomes a big story. The media run with it. And then the police are like, let's check this out. Make sure it's not grossly offensive. I don't know if you followed the case a few years ago. There was a YouTube comedian called uh, Count Dankula. Yes, uh, this... I know Dank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dank, Dank was, he actually not only mm -hmm. was investigated, he was prosecuted and found guilty. And when the newspapers write about him, they're legally allowed to call him a Nazi hate criminal. Holy cow. That's so that? crazy. That's so crazy. Because a comedian did a thing. He had it's his insane. roast. He had a roast a couple months ago, and they were telling, like, they reached out to a few of us comics, like, hey, could you send something in for this roast? We're doing, like, a, a mm. montage. And I ended up teaching, like, <laughs> I ended up teaching one of my dogs how to hile. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty easy to do it's just like you really just do paw and then paw becomes heil hitler and then you know the treats get bigger and and, and Th that's, that's how the holocaust follow. happened that's yeah. how <laughs> <laughs> any <laughs> Well, uh, as, as someone with saying... jewish ancestry i'm allowed to do that joke oh in the good <laughs> If you have dogs out there saying, I, I could never participate in something like that. Well, if the treat is big enough, you know, people do it. That's how that uh, works. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I can understand. Like, it, it, What was your experience? Like, had you ever done stand up in, in the U.S. or mostly, you know, just focused in the U.K.? I, I never done any, any stand up in the U.S. Um, uh, but when we were in um, when we went on Rogan's show uh, last year, he actually invited us to it's not the club that is now in existence i think but it was like a temporary placeholder club that he was at uh, and that was awesome uh like i i said on twitter afterwards that you literally i think you would be banned from most comedy clubs in the uk for any of the jokes that any of the comics made on the night it was that banned. Wild. you would be banned from the club oh for sure for sure it was you, insane it was wild when you were doing more stand up that a lot of comics in the UK were holding themselves back. They were cre felt, felt creatively stifled. Would, would they ever in the green room say to you, Hey, do you think I could get away with this? You know, what was the kind of behind the scenes feeling about how comics deal with the, I guess the, the comedy culture there? Well, uh, uh, you got to remember a lot of them have bought into the ideology. Like I would say a lot of the comics are woke. And they they think free speech is bad and, and and all that shit. But a lot of them also. I remember one time I was playing Top Secret, which is one of my favorite clubs, always was and still is a great club in London. And I was always satirical with my comedy. I always that's why I call myself a satirist rather than a stand up. Really, I talked a lot about political events, cultural things, etc. I remember coming off stage and the gig had gone well. And one of the other comics, also great, a uh, very good comic. Um, he he said to me oh wow you talk about politics that's you know i, I could never do that and i was like what do you mean why not and he was like, oh well, i'm a straight white guy I, i'd get killed wow and and that's that's how some people think and i don't even know if it's necessarily true maybe that wouldn't have been what happened but that's how a lot of people feel and they're they're, they're worried about it so yeah there's a lot of self-censorship going on for sure wow oh god that's so that's so frustrating because I feel, I would love to eventually like do stand up in the UK, but the fact that mm. they're, you know, are there even kind of like 
more underground alty places where you feel like there is one one well, this <laughs> is one that, that that top secret that, place no to, top secret is pretty good top secret in terms of that side of things top secret you know the guy runs it doesn't give a shit so it's that but if you want something that's really un, un uncensored and free uh there's a guy who's a, a friend of mine called andrew doyle uh, he's the guy behind the Titania McGrath uh, Twitter account. You oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Andrew is brilliant. And um, he runs a, a comedy night called Comedy Unleashed uh, once a month. Um, but also, you know, if, if you come to the UK, I imagine you'd be playing largely, to, you could play to your own audience, in which case it's a little bit different. Uh, but if you're doing the, the circuit and circuit gigs, then, then yeah, you, you'd probably find there's only a couple of places where uh, that sort of thing would be welcome true oh man oh man all right we got a couple of questions here for you from push-ups uh mr kissin putin doesn't believe in freedom or individual rights is openly hostile wow we're starting with a, a serious question with the light-hearted ones yeah <laughs> i should have started with the lighter one is openly hostile to america and the west is constantly threatening us so wtf is the right's fetish with him i don't think the right has a fetish with him a portion of the right does a portion of the right. This was the point I was going to make. There's a portion of the right. And I actually don't think it's necessarily a fetish with Putin. Uh, what, what's happened is, um, I have, a, I don't know if you would have seen it, Chrissy. I had a, a super viral Twitter thread, which we later made into a video about why people are vaccine hesitant. Um, Ooh. No, but it sound like, sounds like I would love it. Yeah, well, it sounds like it would it would, it would appeal to you. Um, and one of the things I talk about is essentially how uh, people's trust in the mainstream media and governments and the establishment communication of information has been completely wrecked over the last few years. Uh, and I think, you, you know that meme of I support the current thing? Yeah. Well, there's an equivalent version of that, which is now I oppose the current thing. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that portion of the right that push-ups is talking about is they've, they, they couldn't find Ukraine on a the map. They don't know what it is. It's not something that they've ever, they don't speak Russian, they don't speak Ukrainian, they've never researched it, it's nothing that they've been informed about. But what they know is, quote unquote, the media is always lying to us. And by the way, the media usually is lying to, right? So it's mm -hmm. true. And so they've confused, they think that the algorithm for how to get the truth is to go, well, the mainstream media says the sky is blue, that means it must be green. And this is what a lot of them are doing with Russia. They think that just because the mainstream media is in support of Ukraine, that means uh, Putin must be right. This is not how it works. Unfortunately, you're still going to have to think for yourself, guys. This would be a good time to mention I have a Rootin' for Putin shirt available on my website. <laughs> it's so funny. I made this design because I was like, when it all started, I was like, I don't know, the people that are telling me to like, it's exactly what you're saying. The people that are telling me to like simp for the Ukraine and support it without question are the same people that told me to support without question the vaccine yeah, and yeah, yeah. so many other things. So I'm kind of made this as a joke, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like I say, uh, Chris, yeah, this is an issue for, that it happens. So happens that I'm from Russia and I have lots of family yeah. in both countries and family in Ukraine. And I spend lots of time in Ukraine. So I know the situation on the ground, right? So when people are, Oh, the Ukrainians are all Nazis. I'm like, uh, every time I fly to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, it's me and 300 Hasidic Jews. Oh, wow. Going on a pilgrimage to Uman. If it was a Nazi country, I think I'd know about it. And maybe, by the way, they wouldn't elect a Jewish comedian president. Like, yeah. it's c complete nonsense. But if you don't know a lot about it, and it's just the next issue that now everyone makes you have to talk about, well, I can see why people have that opinion. So it's not a good heuristic. It's not a good way of trying to get to the truth of stuff. Uh, but I can totally see how in the current the media space, some people would be tempted. Now, it pisses me off that that's what they've done because, you know, I have family in this place and I care about it and I know what the truth of it is. Uh, but I, I also get that people's trust in the media has been destroyed. And, you know, what the solution to that is, it's hard, very hard to say because it's like people go, well, we have to rebuild trust in the mainstream media. I'm like, what, this mainstream media that's not trustworthy at all? You know? Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's become much more difficult for people to get information that they trust. And I think, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine has pushed some otherwise quite reasonable people into some very dark corners where, where I wish they wouldn't go. 
Yeah, I think because people get upset. Wow, we're sending all this money over there and and look at California, look at the poverty in our own country, yeah. look at all the other areas that need help locally. What do you think is the biggest misconception about uh, what's going on in Ukraine or like the Ukraine uh, Russia drama right now? Well, well there are about 50, uh, 50 <laughs> big, <laughs> big ones. Um, I think the biggest misconception, I mean, th there are lots of ones. Uh, what I've done on my Substack is I've actually, I used to be a professional translator. I've translated several of Putin's speeches because wow. he says what he wants. It's not like this big fucking mystery. He's very clear about what he wants. And he says it in terms, and the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has made that clear. They want America thrown off the pedestal. They don't like America being the dominant force in the world. They want what they call a, a multipolar world. What that means is they don't want America to be powerful. They don't want the West to be powerful. They want Russia, China, and the United States to all be competing for power. Very bad um, recipe for the world, by the way. Because uh, when you have that, it's like what happens in Mexico when you when you take out the leading cartel. Guess what happens? All the smaller ones start fighting over and, and more people get killed. So not a good recipe for the world. And uh, Putin's made it very clear and people like, don't understand that. Um, I also think, you know, you, you mentioned the point about uh, American tax dollars. And I've always said very clearly, you know, it's up to American taxpayers to decide what their money goes on. I would say the United States is getting an incredibly good deal for its money in terms mm -hmm. of what it's achieving. Uh, because okay. if you think, this is the thing that people don't seem to think about. It's like, why do you think you guys are so rich and comfortable and prosperous and wealthy and stable and secure and, and all that? Only what, fans. What? <laughs> well, maybe in your case, but the rest of us. <laughs> uh, I don't think my only fans would be as successful. Butthole as picks. You never know until you try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, it, the reason that America is as prosperous as it is, is that you, you guys, you know, you're a 5% of the world and you consume 25% of the world's resources. Well, that's because you kind of have a lot of fingers in a lot of pies. You want to let Russia take over the world? You want to let China take over the world? Fine. Uh, but you've got to reckon uh, your share of, of global consumption is going to go down right quick. Is that what you want? Nope. Yeah. So, so when people are like, oh, this is really costing us a lot. Of, well, it is costing you a lot of money but not nearly as much money as it could cost you if you let other people take over. So uh, I think that's something that people don't understand. The biggest winners out of the war in Ukraine are the United States and China to some extent. Uh, yeah. Russia and Ukraine are both losing, uh, which is not good for either of them, of course. Uh, but if, from an America, if I was an American taxpayer, I'd be like, yeah, give them whatever they need. Because uh, A, they are standing up for American values around the world, right? standing up for actual democracy and actual freedom uh, and opposing an imperialist invasion. This is why the kind of the, the anti-war, anti-imperialist left does my head in, because it's like, you guys claim to be anti-imperialist and that's why you're supporting the Russian empire trying to rebuild mm. it? Well, that doesn't make mm. any sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's a lot of misconceptions, uh, but I think the biggest one is like, you, you guys are spending a tiny fraction of your defense budget to achieve results that you normally couldn't achieve with all of your defense budget. So you're getting a fucking great deal, uh, in my opinion. But as I always say, it's up to the American taxpayers to decide what they want that money to spend. How much of uh, why Putin is, uh, I don't know, I don't know if angry at the US or, or wants us to no knock us down a peg, how much of that is because like we're transing everything and we're making everything gay? Like from It's nothing to do with that, but it is a okay. great excuse for him. It's a great, okay. it's, a, it's a great way to tap into uh, the culture war and people, particularly on the right, obviously, who are fed up of, uh, you know, all of this LGBTQI plus up, down, minus left, right, you know, all of that. Um, so it, it's a way for him to to get support in the West. But I don't think that's why he cares about it at all. No. OK, interesting. OK, that's yeah. good. That's that's good to hear. Uh, Push up saying was referring to Tucker and Alex Jones. OK, yeah. His well, I did say to Tucker's producer, if he wants me to come back on talk about Ukraine, which I've written and talked about a lot, I'm very happy to do it. And it would surprise you massively, Chrissy, to hear that I haven't heard back. That's upsetting. Ugh, man, I mean, there's so much you can talk about. Dang. All right. That's frustrating. Um, check out Kissin's interview with Carrie Smith. Oh, you did an interview with Carrie Smith. I love her. She's one of my good friends. Yeah, Carrie's great. We did a fantastic interview with her in Trigonometry that's like done huge numbers. Oh, uh, awesome. 
talking about how she left the social justice cult. Um, it's a very good interview, and I'm a big fan of hers. She's a sweetheart. Uh, from Craig Morning, comedic censorship is obviously fascism, but it also removes one of the chief weapons people use to fight against real hatred and evil, which is comedy. Yep. And yep. comedy is like the lifeblood of the people. It's it's a uh, it's kind of like what what helps us all stay in touch with what's going on. And, and I, I think there's a correlation between how successful and how much money a comedian starts making and how quickly they become kind of irrelevant because they lose touch. Like all their friends are rich and famous. They're rich and famous. It's like. And uh, it's difficult to maintain. Yeah. Doing well is not is not funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jeff, is that why Graham Linehan got canceled? Oh, I don't know who that is. Do you know who Graham Linehan is? Graham Linehan is probably one of the most successful comedy writers in, in, in this country in my lifetime, like hugely successful. He's responsible for incredibly successful, very popular shows. But he just couldn't swallow the trans stuff and became very outspoken about it, and he got cancelled to shit over it. Uh, um, now, to be fair to Graham, he, he's, he's quite obsessive about this issue. Now, you could argue it's an issue worth obsessing about, uh, you know, given that some of the things that are going on. But, yeah, he, he's been very badly cancelled. Um, oh, man. Yeah. But he, he's making a comeback, hopefully, over time. So. Okay, that's good. Uh, from Traveling Tortoise, what happened with that show with Andrew Doyle and others where it was a chat over dinner at a restaurant? That was really good. It was a really good show. Uh, it's called uh, Common Sanity or something like that. Uh, it was run by a friend of mine who owns a restaurant in London. Uh, but I just I didn't think they 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 wanted to pursue doing it. But it was a great show. And there's one uh, with me, Andrew Doyle, Simon Evans, who's a great comic as well, uh, and uh, a priest uh, having a, a chat over an incredible dinner in, in the restaurant. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. I mean, I loved during your speech at the Oxford Union, like you managed to sneak a joke in. And I don't know if this was planned or not, that you were like, uh, <laughs> you're like, we had a baby. Like my wife had it because we're old school or like your, <laughs> my, my wife gave birth because we're old school. I was like, yeah, oh, that's great. I just remind everyone you're funny while while also making great points. Yeah. Jonathan King, do you have a favorite super chatter? If so, come on. We know the answer. Oh, of course it's you. I'm going to pick you because. So uh, just so you know, this is an in-joke and trigonometry. Oh, okay. uh, because for, for, for comedy purposes on our Raw shows, we make a lot of jokes. And frequently, we make jokes about pedophiles. Uh, and Jonathan King is one of Britain's most prolific pedophiles. And so it's one of our fans <laughs> created this YouTube account and sends us money. It's, it's fucking horrible. But. There oh we go. my god so i need somebody to make a prince andrew account and uh yeah. we can do that joke on my show that's funny kevin brady do you think that saying corporate press slash media would be more effective than saying mainstream media many don't understand their motives yeah you know what i i think you're right kevin corporate media is a much better much better term and i i, I sort of try to force myself to use it a little bit more you're right right because when you think uh, yeah and also corporations because you see the thing is the mainstream media they're not really the mainstream media anymore like who's more mainstream joe rogan or cnn yeah absolutely joe is mm. unless you're in an airport then maybe i'll watch a little cnn because it's just on <laughs> push-ups please get graham on the show yes oh that's a great idea i'll hit him up do you think you would ever do stand-up again uh if the bug bites, I will. I, I literally have no desire right now. Like we do live shows with trigonometry, and I really enjoy those. Um, I, I've, I'm, I'm more working on stuff I can't really talk about yet, but more like creating online content that's comedy um, rather okay. than stand up. Because I, I have to be honest with you, Chrissy. I think stand up really doesn't translate well to the screen. You know. You mean like with a, clips or like posting it? Yeah, it's. I, I feel that. I think that's why I'm like, so oh, hesitant to post clips of my stand-up because I'm just like, eh, I don't know. It's better when you're there. Well, yeah. And also look at all the people that are crushing on on all. Like we had Tyler Fisher. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah. Right? I love Tyler. Tyler's brilliant. But the stuff that does really well of his, it's not clips of his stand-up. It's the sketches. It's right? his impressions. Yeah. It's his like impressions, his the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the medium that, that's going to do well online. I, I just think stand-up is a live format. It doesn't translate that well. Do you think stand-up is dying or just there's more competition now? 
I, I I think it, well look realistically I mean dying is strongly put but I think it's going to be a lot harder to be a stand up comic 10 years from now than it is now I mean there's no question because look most people if you've got like you've got this thing right here that gives you access to all the content in the world like getting in your car driving for half an hour finding parking going into a club you know with covid some people are going to be like I don't want to be around other people I don't want to catch you know whatever uh you put all that together the barrier to to going out and seeing a stand up show is higher now and there's way more alternatives it doesn't mean comedy isn't you know stand up isn't special it's a special experience to go and see a live show and there will always be a market for that but fewer people will do it over time i'm i'm pretty sure of that it's also like if you have one of these it's like oh am i going to watch chrissy stand up or am i going to look at naked chicks i think it's like most people would go look at the naked chicks I just know my fans. Okay. Paul Anderson. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to think of something, but I only had very problematic <laughs> things to say. You could say, <laughs> you could say those here. Paul Anderson, get kissing on FNT. Oh, that's the Friday night show I do on uh, Nerdrotics channel. They they talk about like, you know, the the Hollywood, you know, becoming woke and ruining all the remakes of all the movies and franchises we love. Um, yeah, I could definitely See if, if you want to do it. Uh, oh, I could send you an episode. You could check it out. Too. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Push-ups. I'm out of money, but I love you both. Hashtag worth it. Oh, thanks, push-ups. Interesting. Yeah. Because in 10 years, what? There'll be even more competition for entertainment? Yeah, well, for, for, your, for eyeballs, you know. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's going to happen. And uh, the, also, it just it's not scalable. Like... When we do a raw show, we've got, I don't know, we'll have you know, 1,500 people watching it live. It'll get 25, 30,000 views over the course of a few days. Uh, people will send in their super chats. Uh, you know, so we, 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 we're performing to 30,000 people, 25,000 people. As a stand-up, you know, unless you're selling out stadiums, that's going to take you months to, to reach that same number of people. So it just it just practically it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There will still be people who want to do it, um, but it's I think it's going to be far fewer people. After that Oxford Union speech, did any of the students like come up and speak with you after? Like, what's yeah. what's been the response from like these younger college age kids? Well, it's interesting because the 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 whole debate was delayed by three hours because they have these arcane like Game of Thrones style fucking coups and plots and they were trying to remove the president and replace him with some, it was this whole thing but because of that we were we were in the bar for a couple of hours just waiting for the thing to start and there was this girl that came up to me and she was like so you think there are there are woke people in the uk and i was like yeah and she was like well can you give me can, can you give me an example and i was like and so i gave her an example and she's like, okay, so you think uh, you think there are woke people working in corporations? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, can you give me an example? So I gave her an example. And she's like, so you think we have laws that are driven by like woke culture? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, can you give me an example? And I, I gave it. And, and so we had that conversation in which she was clearly like, well, I'm talking to this evil right wing bigot or whatever her idea of me was. But she was open minded enough to ask the questions and to hear the answers. And then we did the debate and she came up to me. She actually chased me afterwards as I was leaving the venue and asked for a selfie. There and you I was go. Like, you changed your mind. Well, I don't or know if I changed my mind. Yeah. 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 Whatever it happened, uh, whatever happened there. But uh, so, yeah, I, I also I think the one slight misrepresentation is it's not like the Oxford Union is this like home of wokeness. Uh, you know, th there would have been a lot of people there who disagreed with with my views, and there would have been a lot who agreed. So it was kind of, it was uh, it was open to be won. I think that room. It sounds from the questions she was asking you, it's like she just didn't believe. Like maybe she has a disassociation from the word or the concept of wokeness. Maybe to her, it just means like you're evolved or you're empathetic, compassionate, or modern. Do you think that was the case? I think she, no, no. I think in her case, she agreed with the definition of wokeness as being this victimhood ideology. Uh, but what I think she was saying was like 
these people don't really exist. They don't have any power. It's like five people with blue hair on TikTok. That was her angle. Oh, but Chrissy, okay. you got to remember, like, what the fuck did we know when we were 18? Like, nothing. You know, yeah. Like right. less than nothing. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's why I've, you know, the message I've tried to get out there after, because, you know, you get invited on Tucker and Piers Morgan and all these other big shows. And it's very easy to go down. The, oh, the young people are all idiots. Workness, 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 workness. And I really, that's not what I believe. Uh, I wanted to get the message across even to people. I mean, you could see Tucker was like, mm, yeah, like the message is young people are persuadable, right? Stop calling them stupid, uh, you know, in seriousness and actually challenge them to be better. And, and, and that's why I come back to what we started the conversation with is what is the positive vision, right? Because, you know, young kids are going to be looking for something cool. Right. And rebelling is always cool. So if they're all going to be rebelling against this woke shit, which they will be eventually, we got to have something to offer them. And what is that? Yeah. You know, right. It's like, what? OK, well, what's what's going to be next when we do change their mind? Like if we do get in there. Yeah. Uh, from Marty Gray. KK. Oh, that's you. Oh, wait. By the way, is your middle initial K per chance? Thankfully not. OK. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, I have an insufferable Georgian coworker slash friend called Pata who says Georgia is the best. How do I clap back, Chief? I don't know. You can, man. Georgia is the best food and incredible wine in the world. It's so good. If you wow. ever get a chance to go, it is incredible. Like the wine, the food is amazing. So, uh, and, and nature is very beautiful there. I've been there with my family. We had a great time. So, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that you should clap back. Maybe just go, go over there, enjoy some good food, good wine. You come back a, a convert. Save your clap. Uh, oh, from the Minds podcast, Kill Tony has been crushing it on YouTube. Austin's comedy scene is blowing up at the moment. Is the L.A. comedy scene dying? Great show, guys. I haven't been to L.A. since the beginning of the pandemic. I was there March, like March 6, maybe 2020. That was the first time I went. And then all the chaos started happening. So I didn't get the best sense of it. But I do feel like a lot of L.A. comics are, are moving or have moved to Austin yeah. to follow Rogan. Well, I was talking to Bridget Fettersy, who's who's a very good friend of mine, who I have like I respect the the, the crap out of her, so and then that's what she was saying is like you know it's slowly ebbing away. All the all, all the cool people are basically leaving. Ugh. So then it's just going to be actors. That's horrible. <laughs> Brett Pound. What a great combination of two individuals to have a conversation. Thank you so much. And one more from Lady Shia. KK, what you do here? Go make raw. Hmm. Roy, Roy's the live streams that we do three nights a week, and Lady Shy is one of our regular super chats. As Lady Shy, Roy will be back uh, on Friday, not Thursday this week, because uh, I'm I'm doing a I'm doing Question Time, which is like a big political uh, discussion show um, uh, instead. But uh, Roy will be back on Friday. Don't you worry. Okay, great, Constant, where, uh, Constantine. Where can people follow you? What is coming up? What are you working on that you can talk about? Um, and yeah, what, where do you want people to to subscribe? Read my Substack, subscribe to Trigonometry on YouTube, and I'm on all the social media at Constantin Kissin. Uh, I'm working on some cool stuff that I can't talk about, uh, so just watch this space. Ooh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm such a big fan of yours. Uh, you're just the best. Chrissy, it's, uh, it's been awesome to be on. Thanks very much. Where are you based, by the way? Uh, uh, New York. New, New York. Well, <laughs> let, let's, let's hook up when we're over. We'll be later this year. Ooh, yeah, that would be great. Thank All you right. to everybody in the chat for you. You had some good questions, guys. You did good today. <laughs> and until <laughs> next time, bye.